CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my usual partner, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. You may hear the disembodied voice of one Matthew Perino, who is in my hotel room right now. I do want to say, for the sake of uh, limiting any rumors that are out there, let me just pivot the uh, camera here. He is not in my bed. He is, there he is, he's right there. He's fully clothed. fully clothed. He's wearing his Buffalo kickoff live shirt, which I will be putting on after we record this podcast and I will be chauffeuring his ass over to SoFi <laughs> Stadium. Um, which you can see from our hotel room. Now you can also see a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, visage uh, of the, and I say visage uh, because uh, it is shrouded in a lot of smog, but you can see downtown LA from here too. Um, big game, obviously, uh, and the NFL wants it this way. It's a reason uh, so much symbolism of the Buffalo Bills, who are the betting favorites in Las Vegas to win the Super Bowl this year, going up against the defending champs in Los Angeles, the city that many Bills fans feared their team would move to at one point. Uh, the Rams will be raising their championship banner on Thursday night. And the Bills will be right there uh, with a chance to, at least because it is just week one, and this is a non-conference game, uh, to symbolically uh, take the torch and claim themselves as the team to beat in the NFL. Uh, Jonah, so much hype heading into this season, obviously we have to go back to the Super Bowl years of the early 90s. So we can't say of our lifetime, or at least I can't. Uh, I do remember, I was in college when the Bills uh, were going to their four straight Super Bowls uh, and they were expected to compete for the big prize year after year. Uh, but I think uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to know what percentage of Bills fans have zero recollection of those years. So, um, this is it. I mean, this is probably the most hyped season opener, even even surpassing uh, when Drew Bledsoe made his uh, and uh, and uh, lawyer Malloy made his debut uh, as a bill and beat the Patriots uh, in Orchard Park. And they ended up on the, the cover of Sports Illustrated for that shellacking. And of course, the Patriots went on and won the Super Bowl anyway. But Jonah, your thoughts on the anticipation for this one? Is it too much? I don't I don't. I guess I'll just leave it open-ended like that. The, the phrase too much can go a bunch of different ways because I don't want to say it's unjustified, but here we go. Well, I think the, the hype and the expectation going into this first game is dovetails and is pretty symbolic of the hype and the expectations for the Bills overall this season. And as far as I know, from what I looked up, I think there's only been one other time in the past, at least in the Super Bowl era, where the Bills were this – preseason betting favorite I think in 1991 coming off of that first Super Bowl and with the way the landscape was with the rest of the teams in the league they were the betting favorites going into that season maybe with even slightly better odds than they have right now but it didn't I mean I was only nine years old at the time but I don't think it felt that same way because there was the 49ers and the New York Giants and the strong teams in the NFC and it didn't really feel like the Bills were the best team going into the season they might oh, you're be absolutely right that was an too. era that was an era where the NFC championship game was considered the Super Bowl. And the next game was, all right, here comes, uh, here comes, uh, you know, the AFC sacrifice to be thrown into the volcano uh, for the crowning of, of the, of the King. Uh, you know, you're right. That's exactly the way it was. And I think too, I want to layer in this aspect of it where obviously our audience is uh, um, a lot of Bill's fans. It's a, it's a Western New York centric podcast. 
Uh, but nationally, people tired of those Bills teams pretty quickly. There were, and that was obviously one of the storylines, as you see when you go back and watch the NFL films, um, recaps of those teams, people were sick of the Bills going to four straight Super Bowls. They wanted a different team in there. So it was a Western New York against the world. Now, every the world is behind the Bills. They're likable. They're hip. Everybody loves Josh Allen. Uh, I contend that he's the perfect fit for the Madden cover if John Madden hadn't died uh, in December. Um, he's uh, he's it. And um, so, yeah, this is a totally different animal. We have to go way back to, like you say, 91. Uh, but then that 91 season is when they got crushed. You know, they, they should have won their first Super Bowl appearance. Obviously, Scott Norwood, wide right, everybody remembers infamously. Uh, but after that, people got into the, yeah, okay, the, the NFC is just too good. But they did have a great season in the regular season and through the AFC playoffs up until that Super Bowl against Washington. And in the preseason, I don't think people really recognize how good that Washington team would be with Mark Griffin as quarterback. There were some parallels with the Bills. I think this was before the national opinion and media kind of got sick of the Bills playing in the Super Bowl. They had just come off that first Super Bowl 25. They were favored in that game. Um, Joe Montana didn't play in the 91 season, so the 49ers, that was a little different moment in time in the preseason. But back to what it is now, because something that didn't exist then was this NFL kickoff game or in the same fashion. And the Bills are favored on the road against the Super Bowl, the reigning Super Bowl champions who have lost some players, notably Von Miller being one of them, but are still structurally the same team that won that Super Bowl. And teams usually, road teams don't win this game generally. I, they're 2-15 and 15 in the 17 instances since they started playing this game at home on ring night, if you will, for the Super Bowl champions. And the Bills are just the second visiting team to be favored in such a game. The last one was the Carolina Panthers after they had lost the Super Bowl to the Denver Broncos. Sean McDermott was the defensive coordinator of that team, and they were favored, I think, by three on the road at Denver, and they ended up losing that game by one. So it's a very difficult game, and this is always a good team playing on the road. It's a very difficult game to win, even for some of the best teams, teams that maybe will go on and be Super Bowl contenders. But winning this game is, Josh Allen said it's like a playoff atmosphere, and it's almost like it's not as important as winning the Super Bowl, but you almost need a Super Bowl-level effort and execution and be able to deal with that hype in some of the same way that you would in a Super Bowl or a playoff game. Well, and I think that's the case. Well, not necessarily this playoff atmosphere that you're talking about, because it is pretty intense um, with the buildup um, on ESPN, on NFL Network, uh, of the local media, of course. Uh, this is Los Angeles. It's not as though the Bills are playing the New Orleans Saints or another small market team. You know, let's say the Cincinnati Bengals had won the Super Bowl and the season is opening up in Cincinnati. It's a totally different uh, flavor uh, than you're having here at SoFi Stadium, a Super Bowl venue with the su defending Super Bowl champions unveiling their Super Bowl banner. Um, but your standard opening day has so much hype. You know, your rookies playing their first game, the jitters, even the veterans get a little wound up. So this being on prime time, uh, the only game of the day, uh, I think that the Bills, uh, you're right, Jonah, are going to have to call on their experience, their big game experience to get them through. Uh, and that's something that they do have. Of course, so do the Rams. Uh, so that's probably a wash in that aspect. Um, and this is probably a question for Joel Staniszewski, although he's admittedly biased as a Bills fan that he is. But totally. Fact, biased. What's that? He's totally biased. I don't trust. Well, any sure. Of the but I but he also could at least give us maybe a little bit of insight as to whether or not this is a hype related two and a half point spread that the Bills are favored by. Uh, or if it's uh, if it's a little bit more of a Vegas hat knows something that nobody else does type situation. Uh, but with it being a Thursday night game, we haven't gotten Joel into the, the weekly rhythm of coming on the show. And, and he will be on again this year. On, I, uh, I yeah. would say my analysis is that it is a bit hype related because I think it opened around a pick. Now, this is months ago when the schedule comes out. Maybe even with the Rams, I think I saw somewhere being a one point favorite at first and it's been bet up to the Bills being the two-and-a-half-point favorite, I think, is where it is right now. Now, that could have something to do with Matthew Stafford's elbow injury, but I do think the hype and, and everybody, you know, I think the Bills are almost consensus Super Bowl favorites. I don't know if I've seen anywhere else that has uh, 
predicted or said another team is a better contender than the Bills are. The Bills are not – for a team that has not played in the Super Bowl in you know, 29 years, and this group has never played in the Super Bowl and only got to one AFC championship, they're being treated as a team that has already won the Super Bowl and is maybe coming back with – reloaded with new and even better pieces and should be – they're like – you know, they're almost being treated like a, you know, a LeBron James team with the Miami Heat or somebody that's just expected to be Mike Tyson in 1986. They are the champions even though they haven't won the championship right. yet. How about Mike Tyson in 1993, even getting out of prison, Mike Tyson, um, even after he lost to Evander Holyfield, he was he was favored in the rematch and everybody saw Evander Holyfield dismantle him. Yeah, there's this aura that the Bills do carry uh, in this uh, it, heading into uh, 2022. Uh, I do want to say do you just think that's too much. I, I kind of wonder if the Bills have earn that yet and if that's yeah. really something you want for a team that hasn't won well before i even answer that i it just i won't because it reminds me that there's this feeling i think and i think even if, if you were to talk to some bills fans you need to remind them because i have to catch myself on occasion too they did not fall one game short of the super bowl last year uh i think there's this feeling that because it was the chiefs and two years ago they played in the afc championship game and it, it was the powerhouse rematch that the bills came that close to the Super Bowl. There was still another game in between. It's almost like people, how, how people remember uh, Brett Hull and his foot in the crease, that it was game seven. Uh, and no, that's not the case. Uh, had, the, had the Sabres won that game, which they still would have had to have scored a goal in game six, they still would have had to win game seven. But yeah, I, there's this feeling that the Bills came so close last year because of 13 seconds that I think we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking that that was the championship game and it wasn't. Um, the, the conference championship game. I mean, they also only won 11 games last year, fewer than they had the year before. They won. Josh Allen wasn't as good other than his rushing stats. And they're down Cole Beasley and Emmanuel Sanders, who of course petered out as the season went and everybody's excited about Gabriel Davis, but uh, the depth behind Gabriel Davis isn't nearly as deep as it was a season ago. Um, but anyways, uh, we can get into a little bit of that later. And uh, we're starting it, the season without Tradavius White, who might be their that's big. best player outside. That's of obviously Hill. big. Uh, yeah, and, and the Bills haven't uh, announced whether uh, whether Kair Elam has, has won the job yet. Um, my guess is that he has, but I, I don't know. We're going to find out. He is listed on the on a well their depth chart that they release, but it's also deemed unofficial. But it is released by the Bills has Kair Elam uh, uh, in that starting spot opposite Dane Jackson, but. Um, is it justified? I think it's justified. And you also factor in uh, the Kansas City Chiefs losing Tyreek Hill is a big one uh, because he is such a prominent part of their offense or has been uh, over the years. And he was the guy who did it. He committed the murder in Arrowhead Stadium last year. And so you take him off that roster, put him on an inferior team in Miami. Of course, he makes them better. Um, is it, so I, I do think it's justified. I, I think they are. A, I think they're the best team in the AFC. Uh, and I think that you're in a conversation with Tampa Bay uh, as, as the best team in the NFL. And of course, the Rams are the defending champs. Uh, so, you know, they don't have Odell Beckham. They've lost Von Miller. I mean, there's some other things, but yeah, uh, you, it, we'll, we'll see if there's at least a symbolic transition uh, Thursday night. Uh, over at The Athletic, I, I wrote a piece uh, in which I listed the 12 most important bills as of right now. Uh, for 2022, and it includes executives and coaches. Uh, I did not put Tredavious White on the list. And that's because, uh, yes, I guess I could talk about his his importance uh, through his absence, but we don't know how long he's going to be missing. It would be to me like when people were saying uh, the year that Peyton Manning uh, didn't play for the Colts and the Colts went one and 15. Uh, there was an argument being made, well, shouldn't Peyton Manning then be called the MVP shouldn't, even though he didn't play uh, just because the Colts were so good the year before and how much they cratered, doesn't that prove he's the MVP without being on the field? So that's why I didn't put Tredavious White on this list. Uh, and I think that what it does is obviously elevates the importance of the other guys. Uh, Jonah, I know you took a, a, a peek at the list and you have some thoughts. Um, I have it here in front of me. I don't want to just totally reveal the list, but we can go through. Uh, I'd like people to go to the athletic and check it out, but I guess we'll have some spoilers in here. Josh Allen is not number one. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll leave that as a uh, carrot for people to click into the article. They can no, we can explain it. You know what? I, I think, well, I, I, know think I, I feel the, the need to explain point. it. That's kind of the point yeah. of the podcast, 
right? I, I, I maybe we we uh, we discuss what we what the work we've done at our at our uh, our real jobs. Well, do you want to start there and explain your number one? Because my notes are maybe a little bit more down the line. Okay, so yeah, I just put Sean McDermott as my number one most important bill uh, for 2022. The reason being uh, that Josh Allen was borderline perfect in Arrowhead Stadium uh, in that playoff game, and they still lost, didn't they? Uh, and so. What happened over those last 13 seconds? What happened in sudden death? Uh, yes, you can blame the, the bad luck of losing a coin flip, but Sean McDermott found a way to lose that game, even though the Bills had two leads within the last two minutes of regulation and most notably with 13 seconds left. So no matter how sensational Josh Allen is, the Bills can still lose uh, on any given Sunday or on any given playoff round. So that's why I made Sean McDermott the most important bill of 2022. And I think that's a good, it's a good selection. And I think it, it, he is the most important, not just because he's the head coach. I think he sets the emotional tenor for this team, which during his time as a head coach, I've felt has always been better when they're fighting from underneath to use, uh, you know, Sean McDermott flavored wrestling term that when they are either the underdog or they can per perceive themselves to be the underdog or think that people had counted them out it brings out the best in them. And it's always, I think how this culture has been built and how this team has thrived over the last few seasons. And that's largely off the table now. Now, perhaps they could lose this first game and put it into their own heads that people are counting them out and regain that type of motivation and emotional state. But I think it's very hard to do when everybody around the country is picking you as the champion and they know the amount of talent they have and the expectations and who they should and shouldn't be better than when they're lining up against them off the field. And, and I just don't, I don't think it's going to be a problem, but I think it's going to be a different challenge getting this team motivated and playing its best week after week when they are expected to win. And if they happen to have a very hot start and they're six and zero or seven and zero, trying to, you know, do that without having, as I said, that, you know, we have our backs against the wall and it's us against the world. You can't really use those framing in your locker room when you are being picked by the world to be the best team three, four, five months before that ultimate game is played in February. It reminds me of two different things uh, that, you know, with team I did not cover, but a coach who I talked to quite a bit was uh, Jerry Tarkanian back when I worked in Las Vegas. And one of the things that he said about his 1991 UNLV team that was going for an undefeated season is that every game was a chore for him to convince his players that they had to get up for this opponent. And these guys have a chance to surprise you. And then they'd go out and win by 36 and have their bench cleared with six minutes left in the game. Uh, and he said it was tough to keep convince his guys. Now, of course, those are teenagers into their early 20s. We're talking about the Bills who are seasoned professionals. Um, but then that leads me to a team that I did cover. And uh, I just wrote about them a few months ago, uh, the 2006-2007 Buffalo Sabres, who in heartbreaking fashion lose to the Carolina Hurricanes down six or seven defensemen or whatever it was. And when that season rolled around, the next season in which they were crowned the best team in the NHL heading into the season, they do win the trip president's trophy as the best team in the regular season heading into the playoffs. But as Daniel Briere and a lot of other go, of those guys on the team have told me since, but were even telling me in the moment, they were – all right, so I'll, let me go back to in the moment. I do recall being out at what was then called the Pepsi Center out in Amherst, talking to Daniel Briere as we were heading to his car. And the playoffs were still, I think, a couple of weeks away. And he was telling me that he was concerned that the players weren't taking it seriously enough, that the playoffs are coming. And everything's been on, uh, they've been coasting and so successful and assuming that because it was heartbreak that ended their previous season, well, they, they, it can't happen again. And of course, heartbreak didn't happen but it was their mindset that got them. There was no switch to flip. They thought that, all right, playoffs, here we go. And that's because, and what guys have told me since, is that heading into that season, they believed that they just wanted the playoffs to start. They were that good. They had gone through the thrill of being that good that when the, the regular season came around and they're playing two and three games a week and traveling and all this stuff, they were just, and they were that good. They were just breezing through opponents. They just didn't care. 
they were going through the motions and thought that there was just a switch to flip once you get to the playoffs, but they did not have that hungry mindset. So that's what that reminds me of. And that's something that Sean McDermott's going to have to manage. Absolutely. Jonah. Um, and and I think that the, I, I think the bills will handle the hype and the expectations. Well, there may be some ups and downs. There may be some weeks when they're on a long winning streak, when it catches up with them in certain ways and there's bad luck and injuries and things that can also derail this season. So I think it's going to be a season and a journey much more than it is just the bills are going to roll through until they're playing in the Super Bowl. But where I think the hype and the expectations have gotten too high and might be worrisome is not the word, but I would caution some fans is within the fan base, because I think the bills fans are already tattooing Lombardi trophies and Super Bowl champion on their bodies and, and assuming that, they're going to planning the parade and thinking that this championship is already won, or at least they're already in the Super Bowl and they're already going to be playing for that championship. And I think that takes a lot of the fun out of the season and, and every game is a, is a must win game. And when they don't win or they don't play up to the standard, there's going to be some worry about whether this team is, you know, as good as they're supposed to be. And the bills could have some lulls in the season or a slow start and still finish where they're expected to be, it, it doesn't have to go straight through from winning this first game to winning the last game without any dips in the performance. And I think if you're already anticipating what it's going to be like to win the Super Bowl, if, for your favorite team to win the Super Bowl, you set yourself up for disappointment in two ways. One, maybe they don't win the Super Bowl, because even as the favorites... Chances are they're not. Chances are. I don't ESPN's, know how you quantify it, but... ESPN's probably, football yeah. percentage index, it makes them has them the favorites to win the Super Bowl, and that is like a 7% chance. Yeah. And uh, that means there's look- a 93% chance that they don't. And then the other one, uh, even the betting odds, I think, are the best odds. The implied odds are at about 10 or 11%. And the, so the football outsiders have it this at 12.7%, which is pretty high. But that's about one in eight chance. That means the Bills could have a team like this and a season like this where they're regarded as the very best team in the league eight years in a row and only win one Super Bowl championship by those odds. So obviously, it's more likely than not that something could go wrong and they don't finish winning the championship at the end. Yeah, that's Super important Bowl. to stay. Enjoy the ride. That's something, I guess, that we should tell the fans. Enjoy this ride because we may not know what this team is until October. That's that's one of the things that Bill Belichick has always said. You know, you don't really even know what you got until October. And the Bills have a really tough schedule to start. Um, even through their bye week, they come out of the bye week and have Green Bay in a primetime game. So they have – you know, they have a tough run. They're going to have Kansas City in there. They're going to have Pittsburgh. And I know the Pittsburgh, you know, Mitchell Trubisky's no Ben Roethlisberger, but um, who else am I missing? I, I, I'm not good with schedules. I know that they uh, they open with Tennessee. That's a playoff team next week. And a lot of road games. Yeah. Like five of the first seven on the road. Something like that. And, you know, where I would say, what I would caution also is that to take it week by week and to keep the expectations somewhat in check so you can enjoy the ride but also you know if you've already assumed that the bills are going to win the super bowl and thinking about how great it's going to be and you're already celebrating this before week one you set yourself up for a disappointment in the way that it might not be the life-changing event that you think it's going to be the bills might actually win the super bowl and you might be at that parade and realize you know it didn't change my life all that materially and it wasn't the transcendent experience that you know, it was built up to be. And I think this all comes from the fact that the Bills have never won a Super Bowl and had the playoff drought and have had a lot more bad seasons than good seasons. But I think the fan base, and, and I don't want to be too pedantic. I mean, have fun with it and support your team and you can believe that your team is the best and going to win the Super Bowl championship. But don't get carried away to the point where when it does happen, if it does happen, you've already kind of burnt out and celebrated it for a full season. And then when it does happen, you realize, oh, you know, it's really just a football game on television that I was entertained by watching. All right. Let me give the schedule uh, real quick for those who are listening and haven't uh, started to Google it. Um, At the Rams, Tennessee Titans in the home opener at Miami Dolphins at Baltimore Ravens, Pittsburgh Steelers at home at Kansas City Chiefs, a bye, Green Bay Packers at home. That's a, that's a tough start to the season. Uh, I, I mean, it's not arduous, and I think that the Bills can come out of there looking really good, but um, to, to expect them to breeze through all those opponents, I think, is, uh, is uh, bravado. 
you know, Jonah, I think that uh, it's time now that we do talk about uh, another team that's not going to go undefeated, uh, the University of Buffalo Bulls. Um, they started their season uh, last week at Maryland, a Big Ten opponent. Um, I thought they would actually have a shot in that game because the Mid-American Conference does surprisingly well on opening week against Big Ten opponents. They, they surprise a team every now and then. Um, you know, Bowling Green or Toledo or somebody will or poke their heads up and, and beat one of the big ones. And uh, um, anyways, your thoughts on on UB and their performance at Maryland? What did you learn? Uh, and I guess how it applies to uh, when they have uh, when, when Maction uh, eventually begins. Well, in a way, I don't I don't feel like we learned much in the context of is this team any different or any better than last season? Because in a lot of ways, even with all the turnover they've had on the roster and the 25 new transfer players that they have, new starting quarterback, new starters in the majority of the positions, I think 17 of the 22 spots, they looked largely the same team. There was a lot of similarities between this game and the game they lost at Nebraska early on in the season last year. The, the one difference that was week two, this is week one. I don't know if that changes things, but with the amount of new players and new faces, I don't think it helped. UB to play their maybe toughest opponent in the first game. Um, you asked me before the game, you know, what kind of chances they had of winning it. And I didn't really think they had much of a chance because I've never really seen UB, even though Mac schools have done it, I've never seen UB go on the road right. and beat a power five team like this. They won at Rutgers one year when Rutgers might have been the worst team in all of college football. They won a game at home against Baylor when Baylor wasn't very good, uh, kind of before Baylor's big run started. And for the most part, they don't win this game. And, and more often than not, it's not very competitive. I actually think that it was somewhat competitive in the first half. It was 17 to seven at halftime. Buffalo did cover the spread. It was a 24 point spread. They lost by 21. So they didn't get embarrassed. They had more first downs. They ran more plays. Um, there were ways that it seemed like they matched up decently. They didn't get blown off the field. The offensive line had some trouble and, Cole Snyder, the new quarterback, was under duress all day, and he had four sacks, but they didn't turn the ball over. Duress. The turnover margin, you know, they had an interception. They gave up too many big plays. Maryland had six gains of more than 20 yards, and two of those went for long touchdowns. Buffalo had one gain of more than 20 yards, and it came late in the game when it was maybe almost garbage time production, you could say. So that was really the big difference. It was almost like a baseball game where they, they had as many hits, they had as many singles as the other team, but – Maryland hit it out of the park five or six times and Buffalo didn't have that, you know, power and big explosive play potential. And that's what they're focused on going forward. Mo Linguist has said, and that's what I think you'll see more of in this game against Holy Cross being an FCS opponent last year, UB won. I think they scored 70 points in the game against Gordy Lockmob is not Wagner. walking through that door. Do you remember Gordy? Lo Do you remember Gordy Lockbaum? I don't, I don't. That was uh, late 80s. Uh, he was a um, fashionable pick for the Heisman Trophy because he played. He started both ways for Holy Cross. Okay. Um, well, a fun fact about Holy Cross is that Holy Cross is the last time Buffalo faced Holy Cross on Halloween in 1970. UB won that game 16 to nothing. That was the last game before UB dropped football for the next seven seasons. And that was a very, you know, that changed the trajectory of Buffalo, which was a maybe a decent program in the fifties and sixties and they dropped football, came back to the division three, took them a long time to get back to division one and even longer time to be anything, but one of the worst college football teams in division one and Holy cross offensive coordinator, Chris Smith is the son of St. Francis coach, Jerry Smith. And there's been a lot of NFL and college football connect connections to the people that have come out of that St. Francis program. There's some San Francis players on the Holy cross team and Holy cross is, a very good FCS opponent. They were 10 and three last year. They advanced in the FCS playoffs. I think in one ranking system, I saw them as maybe a top 10 FCS team. Buffalo's favored by 11 and a half points. They should win this game, being the home opener and licking their wounds a little bit from last week and having something to prove. And just the fact that they just played a big 10 team and now they're going to go play an FCS team. And I think things and one-on-one -on -one matchups are going to go better for them and they probably will maybe have a better performance because they're coming off a loss than they would be the other way around. But this is a very tough 
FCS game, and it's not going to be the kind of walkthrough type experience that they had last year, and they've had in other FCS games early in the season. Uh, Gordy Lockbaum was the show high Otani of his day, 1986. He finished fifth in the Heisman Trophy voting. Uh, after playing uh, two seasons as a defensive back and running back at Ohio at uh, at Holy Cross, finishing behind uh, Brian Bosworth, who was fourth, Jim Harbaugh was third, Paul Palmer, who I forgot existed, he was a running back at Temple, but he was obviously fantastic, um, and Vinny Testaverde was your winner that year. But Gordy Lockbaum finished uh, two spots ahead of Cornelius Bennett in the voting. And uh, five spots ahead of Chris Spielman. So Gordy Lockbaum, the pride of Holy Cross, never played in the NFL. He was 5'11", 195. And uh, he was drafted in the ninth round uh, by the Pittsburgh Steelers. And unbeknownst to me, Jonah, did you know this? This is according to his Wikipedia page. Wikipedia has generally been vetted. You know, it's not what it used to be. He was signed by the Bills in 1989, and uh, but he was uh, released. Uh, never played for the Bills. I I did not know that. I did not know that. I didn't know that. I, I never heard this Gordy Lock Lockbaum. Gordy Lockbaum. Yeah, never. This should heard be. Of uh, you know who's somebody at the Buffalo News is listening to this story right now. They're going to unearth Gordy freaking Lockbaum and talk about his days with the Buffalo Bills. You can bet on that. Although now that I've said that, maybe they won't. But there, you know, there's a certain employee over there that likes looking for this shit. Not a reporter, but it'll be it'll be somebody's going to be kicked this uh, story angle. Who was on the Bills beat in 1989? That would oh, well, that would have to be Mr. Victor Carucci. Carucci. Milt Northrup, no. Milt Northrup is around. He'd remember. I have a feeling oh. Milt Northrup would remember all of these facts and probably tell us a lot more that we don't know about Gordy. Uh, I didn't know that. I do know Bob Cousy. Maybe Vic football. wasn't there in 89. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember how that broke down. Uh, Alan Pergamon. I think that was Jerry Sullivan's first year as a columnist the Buffalo News. I don't know how versed he was on some of the training camp cuts and things like that. But Jerry being a New England guy probably does know this, that this bit of trivia. Jonah, um, I don't even know how to set up our other segment that we want to talk about before we sign off. Uh, Matthew Perino, by the way, has been a good boy. Uh, he doesn't want to crunch his potato chips, so he's been waiting. He has a sub or at least maybe a, a sock a sock full with nickels that he's getting ready to beat me up with or something. There's like some sack he's got with something in it. I think it's does, a sandwich. Does Perino want to chime in on the 12 favorite bills? Are we done with that? Or did you want to? Oh yeah. Well, I did. I did move along a little quickly. You did say you have thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, we can get back to that or maybe you could. I want to look up on the Buffalo edit News this back into that archive. Right. Who wrote about Gordy Lockbaum? Well, while you do that, I'll give you my notes. If you had sent this to me for editing, which you don't often do, but it's happened once or twice. <laughs> I might have told you, well, one, you, you mentioned Tredavious White not being on this list, but I feel like he is on this list because at number four, you put three different boundary cornerbacks that will have to replace him while he's out. And I might have put Tredavious White at number four and then mentioned the different potential cornerbacks. That yeah, could I, probably should have put, I should, probably should have put a paragraph in there. But my reason being is that, yes, that is how important Tredavious White is that these guys that without him these guys have to play but even when Tredavious White is back they're still the weak spot well right and I think that's why he's important because maybe they don't need him right now maybe they can win this game without Tredavious White but it does feel like they need Tredavious White in the end and it's probably part of the reason why he's starting the season on the PUP list and they're taking it slow with his recovery because they need Tredavious White at or near 100 percent in January and February come playoff time. And if Tredavious White were to not return, or if he were to return and get re-injured or return and be a lesser form of himself coming off the injury this year, or maybe even not be the same player ever again, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it can happen sometimes with players who have these knee injuries. I think that would be a huge detriment to the Bills' chances. He, I think he, at times, has felt like the most important player on the defense, although they did do pretty well without him for the most part last year. Maybe he was missed the most in that loss to Kansas City. But if you don't get 
the all pro Tredavious right white back by the end of the season, I think that that really does hurt the Bills' chances of being the very best team and the top Super Bowl contender. Right. I was just saying I should just send Matt a link and he could join from right at his. Let me pivot. We are on an ice bucket, but this is going to prohibit me then from <laughs> looking up Gordy Lockbaum and who covered him. Uh, I, for think the that's okay. I think that's okay. That's okay. Quite a setup. He's actually did he explain that he's got this on his ice bucket? I just did. Okay. Yeah, for like the six seconds time. ago. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah the ice bucket. Don't channel. bump the table. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, I I like what you were talking about, and I and I think if you th- if you're thinking about the boundary corners, I think you got to establish first of all who all of these guys are, right? Like Dane Jackson, I think played admirably last year, but I think we could probably expect the level that he's going to play at throughout the course of the season. He's probably going to miss some plays, especially now that he's going to have to, you know, defend number one wide receivers for other teams, not so much against the Rams, but, you know, as they go along, they'll be playing some good uh, wide receivers. And then I think for me, it's Kyer Elam of the bunch, because if he's not somebody that you can at least put out there and rely upon, it creates all types of problems. Even if Tredavious White isn't um, the guy that he was before, it's a situation where now you're you have Kyer Elam, who's his playing time is getting eaten into by a six round rookie. He's going to be asked about that week in and week out as it's going along. All right, is this annoying you? You were a, a first round pick that wanted the playbook on the plane, and you were supposed to come in here and solve all the speed issues. If there's any coverage problems against some of these elite separators slash speedy wide receivers when they go up against Tyreek Hill in week three the questions then become even more prevalent. You're not going to have Tredavious White, but you drafted Kyer Elam to be the guy to deal with Tyreek Hill in a lot of ways. I know Dan come out and said that specifically, but that's essentially what they've done. So if he doesn't take steps and grow over the first couple of weeks, I think those questions are going to you know, loom even more loudly as the season goes along, whether or not Tredavious White is the guy that you remember or not. And rookie cornerbacks are going to be a weak spot no matter what, just in terms of the mental aspect of learning the defense and learning the the nuances and the tricks and going up against veteran wide receivers and veteran quarterbacks that will try to exploit them. Even if they're good players and good rookies, there's probably going to be ups and downs and a learning curve with any first-year player in the NFL at those positions. And I just think that maybe they're a little too over-reliant on young cornerbacks right now They don't have a veteran presence in that room, if you will. Tredavious White is there, so maybe that's his role while he's not playing. But I think think it's going to be a a better situation late in the season than it is right now. I think there's going to be some bumps in the road relying on that many rookie cornerbacks right off the bat. Not having Levi Wallace, who maybe wasn't the best player, but he knew the defense and he seemed to know what the Bills wanted out of that position. And even just having him there as an example might have helped these young guys. And I think that it's going to be somewhat of an issue early on in the season. Elon might come out and actually make plays. Like, I think that maybe that's the thing that we're not talking enough about. Like, he had his best game in the, in the last preseason game. Preseason games don't matter. He played 95 snaps in the preseason. That is just, I think, 10 less than the other three cornerbacks that went ahead of him combined in the preseason those guys aren't playing at all so they really wanted to take a long look at Elam um you mentioned you know Tredavious White's impact in the room he's not really even in the room right now which is interesting like uh, I was talking to Kyrie a couple days ago and he said that he hasn't really talked to White that much as he's been kind of rehabbing doing his own thing off to the side um so I think that even if things go bad early like that could be something that maybe picks up the group but, it, I mean, when you're talking about the biggest things that you're worried about with this team, that's going to continue to be the one that I think most people talk about because that's where they faltered last year. And the read and react zone style coverage that Sean McDermott and the Bills tend to favor, um, there's a big mental component to that. I think experience and veteran savvy come into play there. And if they end up going to more press man because they think Kyrie Ilham and the young quarterbacks are maybe better equipped to do that early on. How does that, what's the chain reaction there? How does that affect the rest of the pass defense and the rest of the defense in general, if they're accounting for these rookie quarterbacks or are they 
more reliant on Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer and safety help? And does that open things up in the middle of the field? I mean, I don't think this is going to be a disaster, but I think the Bills were the best defense in the league, the best pass defense in the league. The, I think I read almost historic in their how they did not allow long pass plays last year. And there might be some cracks in just how great that secondary and that pass defense can be until they get into later in the season with Tredavious White back and these young cornerbacks have more experience and more reps and film study under their belt to to become the best versions of themselves. Did you find it? What's he looking for? Oh, the Gordon. The, 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 what's his name? Goldblum. Gordy Lockbaum. Lockbaum. He's not even looking him up. He's looking up the bylines from 1989. I do know Milt Northrop covered the Bills in 1989 because I remember looking up the game story after Jim Kelly runs into the end zone from the two-yard line for the game winner in Miami. And the Milt Buffalo Northrop News site keeps story. crashing when I try to search. I can't get on the Buffalo News site on my laptop. I can only get on it on the app. Well, the problem is you guys are too cheap. To There's an advertisement. The news. And I – Oh, I, I, I pay $20 a month to access the Buffalo News. And I think you two are too cheap and bitter, maybe, in some ways, to what? give the Buffalo News your money. Get out of here. Support the local newspaper, even if you have. I'm, trying, I'm on my laptop right now, and I try to search buffalonews.com, and I get a white page. Well, maybe this can be a little cliffhanger. Maybe we can come back next week and answer this trivia question. Actually, I think, I don't even know what question we're asking but maybe we can ask the listeners and viewers of this podcast to answer it for us now it's told me i give a little thing when matt perino can uh, can confirm it says in the upper left hand corner in very tiny print that i've had too many search requests it well, says too many re- too many requests it's like it's that's tapped out well i want to ask perino another question related to your story did, did you know read the 12 12 most important bills under the christmas tree this year <laughs> piece that you wrote story yeah did you look at the list yeah. oh yeah sorry right. okay well then so my question is who i think brandon bean shouldn't be on the list i think his work is done and at this point in the season isn't one of the most important people to the bills in season success even though he's very important in building the I roster explained the why roster. he's number eight yeah and i disagree with the explanation so we'll take him off who did you think was missing perino who, who would you put into that slot because we're going to scratch brandon bean off the list it's a good question um you agree that he shouldn't be on the list? I mean, the guy's got to make moves. So, like, I guess, like, they're not going to make a big trade. I don't right. think. I scanned it. Um, he's got to. He's got to spackle this roster together. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll listen to that, especially if something happens over the course of the season and they have to make adjustments. I mean, this is a groin thing for Isaiah McKenzie. Like, that could be something that lingers. Like, he's looked good at practice all week, mm-hmm. and maybe it's just a, it was a tweak, and they just he dialed it back, and he's fine. But any of those kind of little things to big time players, like I get having to, you know, reshuffle the deck. I mean, look at the two biggest moves for the for the Rams last year were trades in season, right? Or uh, yeah, trades. Odell was a was a trade too. So I could see it. I also get Jonah's point where, in the end, what they do this year, his work is is basically done. So I don't know. I I could see both sides of it. If I was adding somebody to the list, though. It's a good question. Did any did any did it jump out of you? Because there was one name that really jumped out of me that I thought should be on it, and I kept scrolling and I never saw it. Um, Dawson Knox. That's not the name I'm thinking of, but I do think he's an important player. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it kind of underscores how good the Bills are because I think they have a lot of important players and a lot of good players. And this is a little bit of a mix of best players and also most important. Greg Rousseau, players. maybe. No, I th- the player I was thinking of is Tremaine Ed. I think being the middle linebacker, that's a very important position in the role that he plays. I think his performance, the run deep, he's been kind of a bellwether for how good the run defense is in certain games for the Bills. And I think that's important if they can get better in the run defense. The players they've added a defensive tackle, I think, are a big part of that as well. And him being in a contract year and being a captain of the defense. And does that bring out the best in him? Is that a distraction that he doesn't have a new contract yet? Does that linger through the season? I think he's one of the most important players to the Bills' success is how good of a season he had as both a player and a leader. My answer to that is A.J. Klein. And when Tremaine Edmonds didn't play last year, A.J. Klein looked like a freaking all-pro. Uh, and, of course, the Bills were unable to do a lot of things, but 
a guy, you know, who's probably a below average NFL defender and was on the team for special teams purposes more than to be a backup linebacker did okay. Um, and he collected a lot of tackles and yes, there were, again, there's things that Tremaine Edmonds can do that, that uh, AJ Klein couldn't, and it was obvious. Uh, but I thought that the, when you're talking about the most important players, I thought that the step down from Edmonds to his backup wasn't as drastic as some of the other positions, yeah. but he That's was on my, he was on my, on my sketched out rough draft of 10. And then I decided to add a couple of coaches to make a point because I think Dorsey is more important than most players. And of course, McDermott is more important than all the players. And I do think that Bean does have some significance, but I also agree with the take that maybe he, maybe he won't be called upon to do much at all. And I think that that would be the, the best case scenario because that would mean things are going well and there haven't been injuries. By the yeah, way, I, think, uh, I was able to cut through the Buffalo News by Googling Gordy Lockbaum in the Buffalo News to learn. Why wasn't that your first step? But go on. Because I went to the Buffalo News site. If I'm going to search the Buffalo News archive, shouldn't I go to the Buffalo News, click on their search thing and search their archive? Perhaps. But Milt Northrup wrote the story about them signing Gordy Lockbaum. And I looks like Vic Carucci wrote the story about the Bills cutting Gordy Lockbaum. So Vic, the Turk Carucci. Well, just to wrap that up on Tremaine Edmonds, I think there's the potential for another level that he can reach in his game to be the player that they thought they drafted and the Bills fans have been hoping to see on a consistent basis and maybe in a contract year at this point in his career, that can happen and that could take a defense that was number one in the league next, last year and make it even better. And that could be a big factor in the Bills fulfilling their potential. And maybe he doesn't have a great year. He continues to – it's always a funny conversation with him because some fans really think he's the problem, that he should be playing on the outside, that he doesn't have the instincts for middle linebacker. And some fans and analysts think he's a great player and he makes all the plays he's supposed to make. And I don't really know. The truth is somewhere in between that, I think. And it, it, sometimes it's hard for me to tell whether he's a good player or not on this defense. He's obviously a good player, but is he – the player that they thought they were drafting in the first round. The jury's maybe still out on that. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, and Joe Biscaglia wrote about it last year, uh, that nationally, Edmund seems to have a better rep than he does among Bills fans. Uh, he's a pro bowler, multiple pro bowls. Uh, he has respect from the league, but Bills fans seem to be frustrated with him because I think they see how big he is and how fast he is, and he has all the tools, but he doesn't make those – Splash plays, as they like to say. Matt Perino has something he wants to say. Something stuck stuck out to me all offseason. Wait, one of these times when I pivot, I think it would be really good if, like, Matt was in my bed shirtless. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just for it should be a exactly. different look every time. Yeah, this reminds me of the radio show when I used to have to spin that camera around on the the spinning chair to get everybody. In oh, the, the old class. periscope. Yeah, the old periscope. <laughs> really counted on you at, during those uh, th those shows watching right. Vegas. Um, yeah, so two thoughts. First and foremost, I, I, it stuck out to me all offseason hearing Eric Wood. I think he did one of those podcasts. I can't remember what it was, but he was talking about the reason they went out and signed Daquan Jones and like they didn't think they were tough enough on the defensive line. And I mean, it's not breaking news, right? Like you can watch the games and, and take that away from how they played. I mean, Starla Tulele was about as passive as a, of an interior defensive lineman as you can have. But I think that that – if you're, if you're looking at like where there's going to be a huge jump this year, to me, Edmonds is probably going to benefit from Jones and the rest of the balls that they added on the interior more than anybody else on either side of the ball with any one move. Maybe you can make an argument for Greg Rousseau benefiting from them adding Von Miller. That's obviously a big one and probably has a little bit more legs, but it's a, it's, it's a deep nine man defensive line that they can rotate at their will and, if that it's going to be interesting because if that unlocks statistically Tremaine Edmonds, then, I mean, you can franchise tag him. The linebacker franchise tag is not awful. And that's probably the direction they'll go with Al or likely next after they resign um, Dawson Knox, but that's going to be a massive, massive contract for Tremaine Edmonds um, eventually. And I think he, he has the potential to have a massive, massive year, like Luke Keekley type numbers, you know, just statistics wise. If he could just start catching some of the balls that he's dropped over the right. first couple of years, I mean, that's 
that's going to put him in an, an entire different stratosphere. So I, I like your argument. I, I would probably have him on the top 12. I think you raised a good point about the interior defensive line. I think this applies to the offensive line as well. I don't know. Uh, you know, you might be right that Daquan Jones is the most important player in that regard. But as far as the offensive line goes, I don't know which player to pick, but I think the, the guards and the centers and the defensive tackles on both sides of the ball are all in some ways equally important because that was the weakness in both offense and defense, I think, for the Bills last year was their toughness up front, up the middle, uh, stopping up the middle pass rush and being able to stop the run defensively. And if one way or the other, through some combination of personnel and scheme changes and things that they do, if they can get better up front and in the middle of the lines, they're going to be better in a lot of different ways. One more thing before I turn, before you turn it around. I think I would move up Deion Dawkins for the sole reason that I, outside of Josh Allen, if they lose Deion Dawkins, like they're fucked because they don't have any tackle depth. Questenberry, you could throw him in there, right. but we're expecting Spencer Brown to be like, at the level of his best early on last year or more. But I, I don't think that you can go into the season and say that's going to be guaranteed, especially since he's barely played all summer. Yeah, you're right. So well, you could be in a situation where you're looking at like Spencer Brown, David Questbury, or maybe even Tommy Doyle that you're, you're forcing to play. If Dawkins goes down, you could probably make an argument for Morris, but they could probably play Bates at center and move some things around on the interior. Yeah. And that's why I, I made that point, you know, cause they do have interior depth, right? I don't know if my voice is being picked up. It is. Say what I said. No, you say it. Turn okay. it around. They do have interior. They do have versatile interior depth. That's why I put Dawkins on there and Morse doesn't appear. But they had some depth last year and still struggled. They, they had John Feliciano and never really got much right. that they wanted out of him. They had Cody Ford, who, you know, seems like a good guy to bring off the bench. And every time he was in there, that was a problem. I mean, that, that Jacksonville game, Spencer Brown seemed like the most important player on the team because without him, the offensive line seemed to collapse. And the offensive line is a funny position where you kind of need everybody playing well and doing their job, the way the continuity and the way things fit together. Other players can struggle because the guy next to him is struggling. Who do you think is the least important player? Least important player is Sam Martin. Okay. I would probably agree. Um, Before we go, and I know that this is something that you wanted to touch base on, and I'm fascinated by it, and I don't know quite enough about it, but uh, the AEW event that is in Buffalo, is it tonight? It is tonight, yep. Okay, so we're talking about interior line depth. Let's talk about AEW depth based on the little bit that I know. Can you give a quick thumbnail as to what's going on with this CM Punk thing? And now there are, I guess, rumors that guys aren't going to be performing tonight or they're going to – People are getting suspended or leaving there. What, what's going on? And this event happens to be taking place at Key Bank Center tonight. Well, so it's professional wrestling. So you always have to take things with a little bit of a grain of salt and wonder if this is part of the storyline, a work as they would like to call it, or if it's a complete shoot, if these guys really did fight in the locker room. A prominent room. wrestling journalist, Dave Meltzer, says this is not a shoot. That's this, is not, this is not a work. Uh Dave Meltzer is, what did, what did Frank DeFord say about him, that he's the best journalist of the last 30 years or something like that? And that's Frank DeFord. Um, but, um, but also, Dave Meltzer has been worked by some of these things before, too, because that's just the nature of professional wrestling, that they sometimes try to take things that aren't real and make them seem real. And uh, someone like Dave Meltzer might come around on it uh, later in time, but while you're reporting this out, he might not know whether it's a work or a shoot but i do think this is a bit of a shoot it was actually fascinating i mean i watched the pay-per-view all of the matches on the television that i paid 50 dollars to watch and then this free press conference afterwards on the internet was way more compelling because cm punk just went off in, in the ways that you would really love to see professional athletes i think be honest and open and authentic and even petty in some ways but it made for a very compelling press conference and if journalists were writing stories off that and they were you got a lot of great quotes and great comments CM Punk is mad at certain individuals that are wrestlers in AEW that are also executive vice presidents, and he doesn't like some of the things that they've said or leaked to people like Dave Meltzer. And he, and some of this has lingered out, leaked out into the, uh, bled out into the on television storylines. And there's a phrase for that called going into business for yourself, where people had said things on television that maybe they weren't supposed to say or 
didn't advance the storyline properly. And CM Punk chose this press conference, which was really a shoot press conference. The other wrestlers in there were, were and not really. And a shoot really means it's character. legit. It's off script. And yeah. it's, it's not. Out of character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real. Yeah. And just lit them up and, you know, insulted them and insulted their position and their intelligence and their commitment to the business and the company. And then that led purportedly to a brawl backstage with. You know, these are Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, Nick and Matt Jackson are the wrestlers that were said to be fighting with CM Punk and his trainer. And they're all apparently suspended and won't be on the show tonight. There's rumors that CM Punk, who's the champion, might get fired and will be, you know, sent away from the company. You know, CM Punk, for people that don't know, was an old WWE wrestler that quit on the WWE and was out of wrestling for six or seven years. There's a little bit of a history of being a bit of a, malcontent who's difficult to manage but it's something that fits his character and also makes the fans i think interested in him so yeah it's a very compelling real backstage storyline that's going on with AEW wrestling and those are sometimes always the more important we're well, not more important but more interesting storylines to follow is what's going on backstage and what gets reported and what they call the dirt sheets dave Meltzer's wrestling observer newsletter and pretty cool that, uh, well, I guess he was going to be on the card anyway, but this is something that could help Danny Garcia get over. Danny Garcia, the former Buff State student um, who is a rising star in AEW and with CM Punk out of the picture, this can only help Danny Garcia, right? Uh, yeah, I do think in some ways from the, the interest in the television perspective nationally, it overshadows what was, I think they were building this show around. Daniel Garcia wrestling in the main event for the Ring of Honor Pure title. Don't ask me to, you know, stratify what all of these belts mean, but it's an important championship. And I think it would be the first championship he's uh, won in AEW if he does win this match. But also, you know, he, he's a Hutch Tech grad who went to Buffalo State and was training to be a wrestler while he was at Buffalo State. They got a picture of him in the Buffalo Sabres, outside the Buffalo Sabres locker room or in a Casanova Park hockey jersey that was probably from his youth hockey days there and this is being promoted and and booked as a buffalo sports event i mean he's danny rc has wrestled in more television main events than any other wrestler in any wrestling company over the past year um he's considered you know a workhorse for this company at a very young age i think he's 23 years old and he's also only three years removed from a car accident when he broke both of his legs and it there were four of these guys in the car that slid off the road on black ice coming back from a show in Montreal and they were all in rough shape. And if things had gone a little differently, someone could have died in that car wreck. And then he comes back to be one of the best wrestlers in the world in, in short order. And now this is his big moment in his hometown. It's the first time AEW's coming to do a show in Buffalo. And I think he's going to win the championship. You never really know, but I think that that's the way they're going to go with this. And to me, I think it's going to be similar to, you know, like Joe Macy's title fights at the arena. It's not a real sport, obviously, but for the people that watch it, they suspend their disbelief and, and you kind of get the emotion of it being a real fight. And I think if he wins this championship in Buffalo under these circumstances, it's going to feel like an important Buffalo sports moment. And there's other Buffalo people that are probably wrestling tonight, the Butcher and the Blade and the Bunny. <laughs> and I, I don't know all of their real names, all of their shoot names right now, but there's going to be, a number of Buffalo people on the card. I think you'll see some Buffalo people in the stands. Um, the Bills are obviously out of town, but I think you'll see some Sabres or some local Buffalo athletes at the arena and, and maybe shown on the television show. And I think it's going to be a, a bit of a Buffalo sports night as much as it is a, a pro wrestling entertainment event. All right. Well, thanks, Jonah. Full show. I'm going to throw some food uh, down my gullet and uh, head over to SoFi Stadium for a little – Channel Four action, yeah. and I think, uh, I think you need to get some sun. You're looking a little washed out here. Wow. Well, that's the that's the case no matter where I am. The ring light has a setting on it that helps me out when I'm at home, uh, but not much. Yeah. Uh, Jonah, thanks for this. Uh, thank you, we'll, thank uh, you, Matt Perino. And yeah, my thanks to Matthew Perino for helping out on Tim Graham and Friends. Brought to you by CTBK CPAs and Business Consultants. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. 
These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions.